Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program may contain images and voices of people who have died. What this means with these uh, last three uh, negatives, we just can't use them for the Paris exhibition. Uh, yeah, it's devastating. Oh, it's free though. Mulch them up, I think. Up, I think. It's a pity it wasn't usable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's quite a lovely picture, yeah, it's perfect. Well, it's everything I wanted. Mm. I mean, this gives you a sort of um, uh, a basic idea, really, of, of what could have been possible. But that's, that's part of the process, too, about mastering the large format uh, film and the, the highlight of, of great photographers is that they've honed their technique into producing the very best from the materials they have. That's my next challenge on the next part of the project down the east coast of Tasmania. I just want to go into my auntie's place here and uh, see my mum. There's something I'd really want to show before we head off. Four times. Hello, everybody. <laughs> now, mum, you going to come down and have a look at these uh, billboards with me? These pictures on the big billboard? Yeah. Yeah, well, in a minute. <laughs> Oh, gotta, now. The billboards are, are the ones from the, um, the pictures from the islands and, and the, the stories I've been telling from the islands. Mm -hmm. So I want you to come down and uh, we'll have a look at that one, eh? Okay, baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These pictures here are part of the billboard project, part of the overall Tasmanian exhibition of yeah. 10 Days on the Island. These are the very same images that are going on to be shown in Paris. They've got a little memorial there for Annie Ida. Lovely. Beyond the trees, remember that little chapel there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah, I'm just sitting over the lawn here, Mum. It's really interesting to come back um, to see the work on big billboards in your, in your home suburb, in your hometown. And, uh, of course, this is the ultimate in storytelling where you see the stories from, from the islands where mum grew up and um, before they come to town and raise the family. Uh, these are the times that, um, that, are, that are very, very special in my career, over and above the limelight sort of exhibitions and all that. These are the things that really matter to me, I think. I was born in the old Wilton Street Flats yeah. down there. Yeah. Uh, so when all the families come off the islands, didn't yeah. they? They stayed yeah. there. There was big in families. Street, yeah, they're mm. still there. And um, th this was the first port of call as far as, uh, you know, getting their first, what we called the bank homes then. And it's uh, still here, eh, Mum? Yeah, still here. Still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was many reasons why the families came off then, and that was in the 40s and 50s. Well, some of it was forced removal. They, they put you in a place as an Aboriginal community, then they force you back off it. But uh, even the generation of, um, of elders now from that period are, are incredibly strong people who, who had to withstand all that, that hardship. Yeah, Ross is up there the other day. Did he? Shame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're heading down to a little, um, a very small town on the coast. We're trying to find uh, Patsy Cameron, who used to be uh, head of the Aboriginal uh, unit at the university. How are you going, Ricky? Yeah, good, thanks, Patsy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were actually honing into a location where uh, George Augustus Robertson and uh, Manuel Lagena, our tribal chief, had quite a famous meeting in history in the sense that he finally agreed with some persuasion from George Augustus Robertson to travel with him to the islands of the Bastrat with always the promise of being able to return to the homelands one day. Robinson actually came down the coast. Mm -hmm. He goes up uh, a peak to have a look where he is to get his bearings. Yep. And then he proceeds a couple of miles from the camp and um, that's when Manalagena walks up. There's five men and two women in this group. And when they're, they're talking that night, he tells them, and Vicky might like to find the page number, uh, but he tells them that the soldiers are coming and they're going to yeah. kill the black people. Yeah. He actually mm. coerced them through fear. 
But this is what my project is about. It's about bringing a little bit of emotion to history. Yeah. Yeah. Our, you know, our ancestors, our mob, were double-crossed at this particular place and yeah. in this particular part of the landscape, yeah. which is the country that we owned and were taken from. And, uh, you know, then the picture of why the land is the deaths in exile one. So. Yeah. And Robinson's written word, in fact, is, is uh, a fallacy. A great journal writer and all that, but um, I mean, you know, what, what exactly was he putting in his he journal? He was meticulous in his record keeping, yeah. though, but it was from a white perspective. White perspective, yeah. yeah. Dry, dry. They've got a look out, look, they can see, you know, there's a bit of a look out around. It, in fact, was a site that changed the course of history. You know, this would have been here when this meeting took place between Manalagana and Robinson. So um, uh, we do know it was this area here from the marsh there and taken on higher ground, of course, and drier. So we, are, we definitely know this is the place. But it's looking in the landscape too as well. You try to imagine where um, people would have sat. You know, I mean, that's where the tripod goes. No matter what's in the bloody picture, you know, that's where the tripod goes. And that, that's what becomes the real significance of, of the way I come to the country and the way I photograph it. Uh, the ancestors were noted for um, coming to meet, dragging their feet with a spear in between their big toes. So it's about the way you have imagined that they would have come to the country and come to a meeting with a white man. I'm thinking, you know, a sense of history, a sense of time, uh, a sense of place. Done. This is where we was yesterday. We've got that historical mark of the meeting just outside of St Helens here. Now we've moved back up here into Edistone Point. Well, I was going to try and do the, uh, the linking picture that related directly from the meeting place to the final journey. Uh, so in waking up this morning, I'm pretty excited about it and uh, looked back up to, towards the islands and, of course, um, there was nothing visible, uh, mainly due to the ultraviolet light in the distance. It may have happened that they would have boarded the boat here at uh, Little Muscle Row Bay which is further from here, it's further up, which we'll go and have a look at this afternoon. There's the destination over there. That's where they stood in them hills far over there, crying to get back to here. If Flinders Island was more defined, we would definitely be able to make a picture today, but, but won't be able to, but that's that's, that's the place where uh, that's the place where it's got to be shot from, without a doubt. So we're coming into uh, just off Long Island now, which is uh, right the opposite um, Cape Barren Island. Now Long Island, uh, you will see as we go past is. Um, distinguished by a big uh, set of boulders and rocks we call the Balancing Rocks. That's the, the country and the island of my uh, great-grandfather, John Walker Stick Maynard. He was born there. Uh, well, in fact, in that era, there would have been uh, many Aboriginal people born in um, every island you see around here. ancestors were gathered by George Augustus Robinson and brought to um, this place which was originally established as um, one of the friendly missions. We see a monument, a missing park, which was originally um, a commemoration to the chief of our tribe, Manalagena. The burial ground that lies in the front of this monument is a burial ground of some 300 graves of our ancestors, a place that was once marked by our community with crosses to commemorate all 300 individual graves.
to uh, take on a project that is uh, personal as well as being a major project. It's coming back to those things that I know. But of course, in amongst 20 years of drinking, you totally lose base with your own values and your own community and your own identity as an Aboriginal person. I can remember talking to one of my mates after the, the rehab period. I said, I think you know, in some ways I've had to go through all the bullshit to get back to, to really what life is really about. The basic values of caring, sharing and love. <laughs> How are you, mate? Good. Hey. How's your burden going? Yeah, good. Yeah, how you been working hard? Yeah. As you always do? Yeah. What are you doing here? I'm still on my project. Uh -huh. You know when I was doing the landscapes down the west coast there? Yeah. Well now I'm just doing a bit around the other islands now. Uh -huh. So eventually in another year we'll all be able to put all this work together as a big story. Yeah. Our story. deceiving because whilst it looks very easy it's not. Yeah, a lot of black folks worked that island too didn't they? Yeah. Over the years. So 50 years of every year burden so yeah. it's amazing. It's a good holiday to me now. I reckon this is. <laughs> <laughs> What most people and other Aboriginal mobs around Australia will identify us with, you know, is the mutton bird or the, the moon bird mob. It involves so many things about community, the coming together for a cultural practice that's, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years old. And in that cultural landscape of the islands stems a lot of other cultural practice of shell necklace making, basket weaving, uh, the men still practice bushcraft and weapons and so a lot of things develop around that core traditional practice. There you go, old fella. There you go, me. Yeah, yeah. How's the season going, man? Yeah, good old mate. Yeah. Yeah, huh? starting to flare up, mate. Yeah, we were talking about our know, Irish ancestry and um, how there's two, only two places in the world where they have the Christmas fires. That's on Cape Barren Island and then the Isle of Ireland. Um, was obviously a traditional, uh, it's an Irish tradition that's been brought over. Uh, well, we grew up with lots of Irish traditions, the, the old Irish music, the boat building, um, yeah, and, and the Christmas toys. And the drinking? <laughs> and the drinking. <laughs> yeah, don't mind a bit of rum every now and then. <laughs> Remember that they used to say there was an old gravesite over there, two a couple of old headstones and that? I quite, just imagined they'd be down this end of the towards... There was quite a lot of bodies yeah, dug up been. off Nancy Tart, mate. Yeah, yeah. They were taken to another island, they yeah. what they call the Shamrock Graves. Yeah, that's right, yep. They were yep. the ones that were taken from Nancy yeah. Tart. In fact, that picture I took of Nancy Tart from here, that was part of that saying I'm talking about how the old fellows did take some of the bodies away. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, you know, a very real part of our, yeah. of our history. You couldn't get out to Babel, I mean, have a look out there. Oh, yeah, well, that's, the other trip has definitely been on Babel and because it was probably one of the most thriving bloody islands going, wasn't it? 20 odd sheds going there. 32 there was. 32. One stage. I still wouldn't mind taking one picture of the spit up there anyway to tell about how the young fellows used to come across and get to walk down to Lady Baron and get the flower and walk back. And I was the last one to walk off. Yeah. Babel man. The tide went right out. Yeah. So I walked off. Yeah. <laughs> Straight in Lady Baron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah but you could drive right to that spit there, and but yeah. Babel's right in front of you. Right in front of you, yeah, right I know, yeah. 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 yeah, I remember standing there yeah. and the gulch there, which was, yeah. yeah.
Uh, this is the smaller camera, this is the 5.4, which is uh, sort of half of my normal 10x8 uh, camera. Same design and same principle, of course. You haven't got a bigger bellows in the wind and that sort of thing, so the conditions and the locations are sort of define the equipment, really. But at the end of the day, the really important thing is just be able to get the bloody shot. You've got to get that picture. And here we have the, the highlight in there. That's fairly hard light coming through there. I'll probably even just darken that a little bit down here. But it's quite nice in here. It's probably just about spot on, really. Yeah, I actually like the picture. That, that's important for a start. Um, this is going to be a really nice print for Paris, actually. Quite a nice print for the Paris exhibition. Oh, you can tell you're coming. No, I sneaked over. Sneaked over, did you? All right, go make cup Yeah, go make cup of dough. Well, I'm glad to be home. Uh, yeah, bro? Oh, no, no. I was surprised to see you. You didn't <laughs> tell me, that's all. <laughs> We're very lucky here today, boys. My wife's come across the seas to cook the birds for us. Very special. I was wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> Birds for you boys. Yeah, hand picked by experienced yeah. birder. Huh? We're catching 700 birds a day. I think we're topping the island at the moment. Because we worked two wet days that nobody else worked. No. He doesn't buy them wet weather gear either. I said to him the other day, don't worry about the wet weather gear, old man. Just buy them some flippers. Is that wet out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were talking about that the other day, weren't we? Yeah. John said, don't worry about it, Warren. They won't get wet. It's dry mm. rain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we're trying to find a boat for a day. Oh, yeah. We broke down with the motor there. They was heading out over the chapel. Uh, right up, mate. Okay, we just got off at uh, Shag Bay in uh, Chapel Island. We got Anita, my wife, and her sister Lena. And they actually used to be here uh, with the family when I was um, only babies. This used to be a thriving mutton bird island at one stage. It's been closed down for, I don't know, probably 20 years. I wouldn't have a clue, really, a long, long time. And there are lots of old stories here from many, many generations back. So still a very special place. Light's perfect. That's about where we want him. Right there. But this this is good. The, the light's beautiful here. And uh, we just get that one in and then and get one shooting back with flinders in the background because this bay here was actually important too where they loaded the birds on. It was 1975 that I was here working in this shed. My mother and father and all my brothers and sisters were tiny little kids. My name's on the wall down there in the old pluck house with my father's name as well. Pretty sentimental place, brings back really fond memories for me. We're at Lily's Beach. We've come up here to do a shot that I've thought about for a long, long time. I guess I can build upon that picture I did of the, um, the monument headstone over at the grave, grave site there, Waibalina, just over here. And that one was about deaths and exile. People here who stood on the hill and on the beaches here looking across to their um, original homeland and uh, just longing and pining for home. It's as simple as that. This one will be a little bit different. Um, I'm literally putting myself in the picture. I 
I'm just getting the shot lined up and uh, I need a bit of help from the crew. You're not in the middle of the frame? No, I don't want to be in the middle of the frame. OK, no. We're making art here, mate. <laughs> Can you click that one, I say? Yep. OK. I do, just push it. Yeah. OK, you ready? On the count of three, because I've got to hold my breath, very slow exposure speed. One, two, three. To have a European exhibition, it's just amazing. And it's only two weeks away now, so it's starting to get uh, really exciting. <laughs> And uh, we, we've done a lot of work. I mean, the curators in Sydney have, have worked around the clock. Yes, yeah, so we've only just got to the stage where we've completed a lot of the texts and corrections. And I love this one. This one's by, uh, by my grandfather, George Maynard. And uh, he says, as late as 1910, men came digging on Vansittart and Tin Kettle Islands looking for skeletons. Here we moved them where none would find them. At the dead of night, my people removed the bodies of our grandmothers and took them to other islands. We planted shamrocks over the disturbed earth. So the last resting place of those girls who had once slivered over the rocks for sills will remain a secret forever. Grandfather George Maynard. Yeah, my wife Anita, she's coming with me and she's always there to support me and it's gonna be great for her too to see that we work on a tiny little island in the Bass Strait and um, the stories we tell here of us as a people and our culture and uh, our continuing history uh, to be seen in the middle of Europe in the hub of world uh, documentary photography is, um, you can't beat it. I think when we'll get to Paris and we'll see those works on the walls and in the gallery of the Australian Embassy, where the exhibition is, and we'll see the real power of storytelling when it can reach audiences um, through Europe from the other side of the world. It's a new one that's just out today. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So they've done this incredible yeah. publicity hit here. Yeah. 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 They're all going portrait of a distant land. Yeah. Systematically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 How are you, Rick? How are you? Good, mate. Good. Yeah. Okay. Got the presentation at six, huh? Six, yep. In, yep. The, in the theatre. Mm -hmm. If you could be here at, at 5.30. Right. And then the other thing we have confirmation of uh, now is that the another weekly, Courrier International, is going to run a mm -hmm. portrait, Bruce, Bruce, yep. on the front. En Europe, on a l'habitude de considérer qu'il n'y a plus d'aborigènes en Tasmanie. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette idée-là, ou de ce mythe En Europe, nous sommes inclinés à croire qu'il n'y a plus d'aborigènes en Tasmanie. C'est la raison pour le projet. Nous savons qui nous sommes, et d'où nous venons, et comment nous avons pratiqué une culture continue de vivre toute notre vie. It's our interpretation of our history. Uh, there are stories that haven't been told before. Uh, before I make my short thank you list, but very important list, uh, I'd like to call upon the Ambassador Winsley to uh, receive this kiss from the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, in, in, which all made possible by my wife, Anita. It's a traditional shell necklace from our country. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's exquisite. Hey, Fecto.